Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm extremely happy to be at the World Government Summit. My name is Merwan Deba. I'm Chief Researcher at the Technology Innovation Institute. My talk is, about, is going to be about the future, about what's going to happen around 2030, and especially one of the key technologies in wireless called 6G, which enables basically the transition from a world where we connect things to a world where we connect intelligence. I think you've been all familiar with what we call the G-waves, what we call generations, and especially one of the key technologies called 2G, which was a mass success in terms of wireless, and for which the aim was to provide mobile for voice, meaning the ability to have a seamless connectivity with calls around the world. By 2000, we started deploying another technology which provided data at each part of the world, uh, which is called 3G. By 2010, we started deploying another technology called 4G, which were, for which the focus was mobile for internet, meaning having the same kind of experience that you have at home in wireless EDSL, but at any point with mobility. Within the realm of 5G that we're seeing today, especially with the start of 2020, for which we have a massive deployment around the world, our aim was to connect things with a focus around what we call the Internet of Things. This massive amount of objects for which we're gathering with sensors a lot of information and in which basically AI is having a breath in which to play. Today, a new transition is happening in wireless, and that transition is called 6G. That transition is not looking anymore to connect objects. The aim is to connect intelligence, and that will be the purpose of my talk, uh, in which I'll be figuring out what are the key technology trends around that and the kind of forecast we're seeing in terms of application of this technology called 6G. If you look at this hyper-connected intelligent world that we're trying to build, there's three big trends that we're seeing. The first one is the fact that the use of waves today and in the future will not be any more about just sending bits. It's going to be about beyond using bits. One of those beyond things is about especially sensing. The kind of waves that we're using and the frequency that we're using enable us to have massive applications in terms of reconstructing the environment or localization. Second thing also that we're seeing with the waves is the fact that we're still in need of higher bandwidth and higher data rate. And this comes, of course, with the use of a lot of higher frequencies for which we can send up to terabytes of information and for which we'll be seeing a lot of applications around 2030. The last one is the convergence of communication and computing. That convergence is extremely important in the sense that we're building, thanks to the wireless cellular network, a huge large-scale computer on which the computing is moving more or less towards where the data is rather than the data where, where the computing is. This is a big trend which is happening already in the classical computing arena with what we call post Neumann architectures in terms of bridging the gap through what we call in-memory processing. And we'll see how this large-scale computer will enable a lot of big applications uh, in the next years for us. Let's start basically with the sensing capability. Sensing has started with the cameras that we've been using. And as of today, the kind of phones that are being deployed enables you to have a better kind of perception than the classical eye. Now, of course, this is not enough. It's not enough to be able to localize with an extremely high accuracy, but also to be able to reconstruct your environment. The kind of frequencies that we're using today and the breakthroughs that have been made these recent years enable us to start using higher and higher frequencies, going beyond the sub-6 gigahertz frequencies that are used in the classical cellular setting to millimeter wave communication and even terahertz communication. Now, one of the big key aspects about frequencies is that the higher you go in a frequency, the better you can see your environment. And by better seeing your environment, you can have a lot more applications that you can do before. So let me go on a couple of applications. First, what are the kind of applications that we see at the terminal side? At the terminal side, we have, of course, the capability of reconstructing even the molecules that you're eating within a sandwich. And basically, this is enabled to the fact that uh, the waves can see beyond, basically, the classical realm of the, of the classical wireless communication. Second is infrastructure sensing, meaning using the cellular to be able to reconstruct the buildings that are surrounding us, even the texture which is surrounding us. 
And this is, of course, uh, enabled thanks to the data analytics which are behind. Because once we see the waves which are sending information and being able to sense, then the data which is gathered is classified, crunched, and then we can get some meaning of that and reconstruct things on our computer. Second thing which I think is extremely important is, of course, the rise of AI. I think you're all familiar with these three figures uh, which, are, which have won the Turing Award in 2019. AI is not new. It started already in around 1956. Uh, with a lot of conferences. It went through a couple of winters. But since 1989, we've seen a big rise, especially with the use of what we call deep neural networks. The main reason now it's happening now is because of three things. The first one is the massive amount of data and storage capability that we have on which we can exploit basically all that information. Second is the computing power. And this has been a drastic change on which basically we can compute a lot of information at a very fast rate. And the last key asset is the kind of sophisticated algorithms which has been built up since 1989 with, of course, the advent of deep neural networks, but now a big breadth of new algorithms which enable us to crash, classify the data, and be able also to do some kind of regression and prediction out of it. Now, in terms of impact on the communication systems, well, it's quite immediate. The kind of system that we've been building have been very, what we call, centered, centralized, cloudified, in the sense that the huge amount of devices which are in our networks, in general, gather data which is sent back to the cloud and which we do what we call the training and then the inference to create models and then conclusions which are sent back to the devices. Typically, this is what you would aim in terms of controlling a car with a 5G systems. Now, of course, with the ability of building more and more AI at each point of the network, we can run those algorithms directly on the devices very far away. And one of the reasons we're doing that, well, there are many cases. The first one is related to what we call privacy constraints, for which the data cannot move out from the device anymore. The second are basically coverage constraints, for which sometimes we're not connected with a device which is far away. And the third one, of course, related to these aspects, is also uh, the latency which is incurred in the sense that we don't have much time before we get the conclusion. And especially in the automotive industry, you can understand how critical those aspects can be. Of course, it changes totally the way a communication infrastructure is built in the sense that we start to have more and more systems which are distributed in how they operate. One kind of algorithms that are being embedded in our networks are what we call distributed AI, enabling, of course, to leverage from the massive amount of devices the kind of data that they have, and in terms of bringing what we call collective intelligence out of a massive number of single intelligence. Other types of algorithms, like feathered learning, are also part of that, in which basically the data does not at all go from the devices, but the model learned from the different devices are federated to create some kind of meta models, which is then spread across all the network. And this, of course, will create a new kind of supercomputer on which basically we will be moving the computing at each node toward where the data is, instead of moving the data where the computing is. The last point, which is extremely important, is of course the classical uh, trend of communication, which is what we call the broadband. What we mean by broadband, well, sending more and more data rates. So why would we need to send more and more data rate in the future? Well, there's many applications that we're seeing for which the actual kind of wireless systems are not enabling that. The first one is everything which is related to holoportation. By holoportation, we're not moving one person to another person uh, in a different place, but we're moving the senses from one place to another place. And rebuilding basically one person in terms of all the different kind of information to another place requires a lot of the data rate. We're talking about terabit wireless. When you're thinking about 5G, which is around 20 gigabits per second in the best case, you're seeing the huge gap that we're having between 5G and 6G. The other also is the ability to provide the data rate at any point in a 3D scenario. Why? Because we're seeing also a lot of what we call flying terminals, which are going to be happening. And this is also extremely putting at a burden our network. And the last one also, in terms of better connection, is basically the fact that we need more and more latency requirements, which are compatible with the kind of application that we're having. And those kind of latency requirements 
requires less than one millisecond latency. The kind of data that is required also, and I should mention, is also the huge amount of today cameras which are deployed, mobile cameras, which are pouring more and more data in our network in the uplink. And this is also a scenario on which 6G will focus on in the next years. Now, how we can do it? Well, we have to go back to the roots. To go back to the roots, I think you're all familiar with the classical system of Shannon of 1948, building basically a communication scheme from a transmitter or receiver. One thing that we not take into account is, of course, the ability to compute that information at the transmitter and receiver and also store it, which changes the whole paradigm of how you do communication. We humans, whenever we communicate, we exploit the past in terms of communications. The way protocols are done today do not exploit the past. Every communication is a new adventure or a new call that you make. Whenever we humans communicate, we tend to take the kind of context that we have built to exploit that information in a better way. We start building what we call semantic communication. This is a big trend that we're trying to figure out today at TII and trying to work on it to build up the kind of network which exploit that semantic communication whereby communicating more, you need to communicate less in the future. I think I gave you rapidly an overview of what's waiting for you by the year 2030 with this big shift of our systems of communication for the, um, connectivity which is mostly tailored for things towards a connectivity which is tailored for intelligence. Thank you for listening to my talk and I look forward to be with you next time.